6, 1917, the United States declared war on Germany. Many ground troops had to be trained for fighting in France. It was also necessary to build a force to fight in the air. Not only were airplanes needed in large quantities, but men had to be trained to fly and maintain them. It wasn't long before hundreds of young flying cadets, wearing identifying white bands on their hats, began reporting to flying schools in the United States, Canada, and Europe. Ground school courses were designed to prepare the men for flight, aircraft construction, cockpit controls, control surfaces, armament, and the operation of machine guns. For men who were anxious to fly, it seemed as though the ground school classes would never end. But the day finally came when it was time to go up and apply what had been learned in ground school. Very few had ever ridden in an airplane, and the first flight was an experience that each cadet would remember in a different way. Initial flight training was directed by an instructor who flew in the front seat. His job was to teach the student the do's and don'ts of flying, such as how a plane got into a tailspin, and how to recover safely before crashing. The big moment came when it was time to go up alone, the first solo flight. After a few words of both caution and encouragement from the instructor, the cadet took off alone for a short flight around the airfield. Then came the most hazardous part, the first solo landing. A three-point landing on the first solo flight was more luck than skill. The student continued to fly, both with and without an instructor, gaining experience and confidence. Much time was devoted to flying single-seat planes in preparation for combat duty at the front. Finally, Graduation day arrived. They'd earned their wings. While pilots were needed to fly the planes, many men were needed to maintain both engines and planes. Their responsibility would be to keep the airplanes in top flying and fighting condition. Pilots had the highest respect for their ground crews, knowing that their chance for survival was increased by their efforts. The first American squadron to fly combat was the 103rd Aero Squadron, formed from the famous Lafayette Escadrille. They began combat flights as the 103rd in February of 1918. Two months later, the United States began sending additional squadrons to the front. Two fighter units, the 94th and 95th Aero Squadrons, flew obsolescent Newport 28s purchased from France. The 94th scored its first two victories over a relatively inactive sector near Toul, France on April 14, 1918. When the 27th and 147th Aero Squadrons arrived at Toul, the four units were organized into the famous First Pursuit Group. Additional fighter squadrons sent to the front in the summer of 1918 were flying the latest French-built plane, the SPAD-13. SPADs were also assigned to the first pursuit group, replacing their older Newport 28s. The highly regarded SPADs made it possible for the American pilots to meet the enemy on equal terms. Almost daily, American fighter units also crossed the lines to look for enemy planes and observation balloons. Along the British front, which extended to the English Channel, 
two American fighter squadrons were flying with the Royal Air Force. These two units, the 17th and 148th Aero Squadrons, flying British Sopwith Camel airplanes, were pitted repeatedly against some of Germany's top fighter units. The Americans compiled an impressive record against them. America's first observation squadrons began combat by flying antiquated AR-1 airplanes. The situation was remedied in April 1918, when the United States Air Service purchased a most capable observation plane from France, the Samson. The observer rode in the rear cockpit and was provided with two flexible machine guns to defend against attack. The Samson was used to spot enemy troop concentrations and movements, photograph enemy targets, direct artillery fire, and maintain surveillance of the enemy's rear areas. Flying deep into German territory, the Salmsen frequently came under air attack by enemy fighters. The United States Air Service also used captive balloons for observing the enemy. Suspended in the air immediately behind the American lines, the balloons were highly vulnerable to attack by enemy fighter planes. The United States obtained its first bombing airplane from France. Called the Breguet, it looked awkward, but it was strongly constructed and could fly high and fast with a full load of bombs. It was used to attack railroad yards, supply depots, and troop concentrations far behind the enemy lines. The American-built DH-4 began arriving at the front in appreciable numbers in August of 1918. Most of them were built in Dayton, Ohio, and a total of 1,213 was shipped to overseas squadrons. 543 of the American DH-4s saw combat action before the cessation of hostilities. They were powered by the famous Liberty engine and served a dual role assigned to both observation and bombardment squadrons. The rear cockpit was equipped with one or two machine guns, and dependent on the mission flown, it might also carry a camera, bomb sight, or wireless set for sending messages. After long, dreary months of combating both the enemy and the infamous French mud, the men on the front were elated when they learned that the fighting would stop on November 11, 1918, at 11 a.m. Now they could go home and pick up where they left off. The men who returned were greeted with a tumultuous welcome from throngs of proud fellow Americans. A few were received as special heroes. Long to be remembered would be men such as Billy Mitchell, who directed America's combat effort in the air, and Eddie Rickenbacker, America's ace of aces. But some men, such as the legendary Raoul Lufberry, who died while attacking a German two-seater, would never return. They would remain in France, resting in the soil of the nation where they had made the supreme sacrifice. Air Force was born, and as early as 1898, 
the War Department showed interest in the glider. But it took a pair of clever bicycle makers who tinkered with a man-carrying kite to add imagination and power. Wilbur and Orville Wright gave the glider a water-cooled engine of their own design and two chain-driven eight-and-a-half-foot pusher propellers. With the toss of a coin in 1903 at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, won Orville Wright the chance to be the first man in history to fly under power. Airtime, 12 seconds. Distance, less than the length of a B-36 wing. Wilbur Wright went to Europe in 1908 to find a market for the flying machine, which up to then they were unable to sell. His flights on the continent attracted the president of France, as well as the kings of England, Spain, and Italy. To Wilbur, it was endless work. In addition to acting as pilot, he was ground crew, mechanic, and salesman. A team of horses pulled the plane to a wooden monorail. This was to serve as a runway on the grassy field. Lifted by a few men, the flying machine was swung into position facing the wind. To provide thrust for the takeoff, the Wrights had developed a weight-falling catapult. After the props were spun, the engine kicked over. Wilbur and his passenger, a French journalist, took seats on the lower wing and braced themselves for an exciting ride. He convinced Europe, winning applause, but no sale. Back in America, encouraged by President Teddy Roosevelt, the War Department opened bids for a heavier-than-air flying machine. Signal Corps specifications required that it carry two persons a distance of 125 miles at an average speed of 40 miles an hour. The Wright signed a stiff contract. Finally, at Fort Myer, Virginia, they flew a machine that was accepted as U.S. Army Airplane Number 1. By 1913, 41 Army pilots were decorated with these gold military aviator wings. Among them was Lieutenant Henry Arnold, who later, as commanding general of the AAF, led two and a half million airmen to victory. Another aviation pioneer, Glenn Curtis, also built early Army trainers. Soon, more inventors improved the machine with tractor instead of pusher propellers and the Army began to see the new airplane emerge as a weapon. By 1916, our only trained aviators were a few Americans flying with France, and they made us proud. They were the famous Lafayette Escadrille, started by Norman Prince, William Thaw, Victor Chapman, and Bert Hall, who courageously fought when Germany had full control of the sky over Europe. When German U-boats forced us to declare war, American air power ranked 14th. Believe me, we were far from ready. I was a rookie cadet, I ought to know. They gave us wooden guns and told us we were going to turn the tide. You know, in a couple of weeks, we began to look as though we might do it. For training equipment, we molded our own bombs out of plaster. Pretty soon, we trained with the real things, Lewis machine guns. Having met the requirements, we were issued leather flying togs and helmets. Assignments were made. We got a chance to fly. First, we made a pre-flight check of the bailing wire planes. Then, we tried our wings. Fifty hours in the air, a few bombs. We were checked out, ready for advanced training overseas. America was producing airmen, but we didn't have a single fighting airplane. Only a few of our leaders were wise. Newton Baker, Secretary of War, was one. He insisted, Supremacy of the air in modern warfare is essential. Woodrow Wilson was another. The president asked for $600 million to meet the needs of military aviation. 
Meanwhile, Red Cross girls saw us off on our way overseas. Since Congress couldn't vote us time, we went to France without airplanes. But we did go in style. Camouflaged luxury liners like the Leviathan were used as troop ships. Some of us half-trained flyers went to Britain and Italy, but most of us went to France. There we found cities of wooden barracks and muddy streets. In outdoor classes, we practiced gunnery. Wooden models helped us learn how to lead a plane with our fire. Battle-tested aviators took time out from the war to show us how to handle a stick. Finally, we soloed. The first ride was always a thrill and a bumpy experience. However, it was much easier to talk about turning the tide than to produce fighting aces overnight. Even if some of us were lucky. Late in 1917, France met the AEF's first Aero Squadron, commanded by Major Ralph Royce. His outfit was the first to see action, and they proudly pasted paper iron crosses over enemy bullet holes. Our commander was Colonel Billy Mitchell. America's first flyers were there. General Benjamin Falloy in command of supply and schools. Colonel Thomas Milling, head of air service units, 1st Army. And Colonel Frank Lam for the 2nd Army, commanded by General Bullard. When Major William Thor and the Lafayette Escadrille became the 103rd Aero Squadron, they brought a record of triumphs. Thor, five German planes down. Lieutenant Larner, three. Lieutenant Merrick, one. Lieutenant Tobin, three. Don't forget the aces. Captain Field Kindley with 12 victories, and Major Raoul Luffberry with 17, before they were both grounded forever. Then those who lived to take part in another war, Captain Elliot Springs with a score of 12, and the ace of aces, hat of the ring Captain Eddie Rickenbacker with 26 victories. America's airplane factories and us war workers didn't get started until late. To make airplane wings, they took us house carpenters, furniture upholsterers, even seamstresses with high pompadours. Meet Rosie the Riveter, 1917. Painters use varnish that smell like bananas. The fuselage, which we finally chose, was of British design. The engine was all American. Its manufacture was the outstanding production achievement of the war. In all, 4,500 DH-4 airplanes, powered by the Liberty engine, were put together in this country. They were built by Ford, Lincoln, Cadillac, and Packard, automobile manufacturers. Curtis, Martin, and Wright Still famous plane-making names were busy assembly plants in those days. World War I gave America its great aircraft industry. Each plane was test flown. Then, the thousands of parts were painstakingly dismantled for packing under guard. Crated and addressed, to the front. In France, husky mademoiselles handled the wings like toys. Here, parts were reassembled into the fighting craft, which helped sweep the enemy out of the sky. May 1918, and the first American DH-4s rolled directly from assembly sheds to the airfields. Only eight months after they were ordered into production, they joined American aviators ready for the big push. When the order to prepare for battle was given, truckloads of aerial bombs were delivered to the planes. There, armorers fused the bombs and loaded the racks. Then the boys who had to take them up made sure the job was done right. The boys still talk about the big push. When we lifted the flaps that September morning in 1918, everything was ready. Billy Mitchell had asked for every Allied airplane that could fight. We brought them out. The brass ordered a tremendous air force to control the skies over the Samahil sector. 
This was the first Army's field of battle. For the dawn takeoffs, we put flares on our wingtips. Every Allied field on the continent gave its claim. General Mitchell called for 1,500. We actually got 1,481 off the ground. Wooden props bit into the air and the engines began to rev up. Our mission was to protect the doughboys of the First Army. Some had orders to bomb and strafe enemy installations, others to engage the Germans in the air. This was it. Each pilot had been carefully briefed for his part in the mission. U.S. aviators in 609 American planes, now a solid part of Allied air power, rose to attack. Germany put albatrosses, Fokkers, more than 30 different types of planes in action to fly no man's land patrols. Some of the Huns dropped bombs by hand on our troops. With over 120 different types of aircraft, the Allies fought back. Our boys were always quick to single out the enemy and come in close to attack. The German was hurt. He tried to escape, but couldn't make it. Our pilot signaled that he had made another kill. And after a victory roll, he rejoined his buddies. Other enemy ships strafed our observation balloons, burning them out of the sky. Allied air power struck back in force. The sky was a beehive of battle. We overwhelmed their air defense, winning and holding air superiority. It was almost the same a few weeks later in the Meuse-Argonne offensive, where we bombed with telling effect in the most notable aerial effort of the war. November 11, 1918, closed a chapter in the unending story of the United States Air Force. Visual history has shown us some of the courageous men, in uniform and out, who cradled the dream of flight and gave us aviation. In the history-making jobs that lay ahead is the inspiring chronicle of more Americans who continued the pioneer spirit. Men with an idea who planned and worked and fought to build the greatest striking force and protective power in history, the United States Air Force.